so far, all I've been able to do with this tape machine is get it cleaned up and play back some of my old reels. I needed to run a lot of cabling and put in a whole new patch bay just to even use it properly. But today, I'm gonna try recording something on it, see how it works. I bought this Tascam MS-16 way back in the 80s because I read that Todd Rundgren had recorded, produced, and mixed his own records in his own studio. And I decided that's what I was gonna do. It cost me $12,000, which was a lot of money back then. I had to get a bank loan to even be able to do it because I was painting houses, doing handiwork and carpentry to support myself at the time. Before long, word got around that I had a 16-track machine in my basement, which was kind of rare back then. That was a good thing because it helped me pay for it and it helped me learn how to record and how to use this machine. And one of the first things you learn is that you've got to clean the heads and the tape guides before you use it. And if you were working on a long session, you might clean it two or three times during the day. The heads are how you record sound onto and then play back off of the tape. As you can see on this machine, each head has 16 zones that can record and play back on one little sliver of tape, which is why this is called a multi-track. The first head is the erase head, which will erase anything on the section of the tape that you are about to record on using the record head. Also called the sync head because of its ability to play back pre-recorded material at the same time that you're recording new stuff. But the dual purpose of this head causes it to have lower quality when listening back to what you recorded. That's why we have the playback head, also known as the repro head. So, after you are done recording, you would switch from sync mode to repro mode for mixing. As with most analog gear, these machines needed to be calibrated on a regular basis. So to do that, we would use something called an MRL tape, Magnetic Reference Laboratory. These tapes came with pre-recorded tones on them for measuring and calibration. This reel has a one kilohertz tone, a 10 kilohertz tone, and a 100 hertz tone. At its most basic, you would play these tones back to make sure that each track was playing back at the same level on both the sync head and the repro head. You would do this by adjusting these little dials. As you can see, there's a group of them for each track. After that, you would put on a reel of blank tape and record tones from a tone generator to all your tracks and adjust a different dial to make sure that all your tracks were recording at the same level. And as I said, those are the most basic calibrations you could do and I would do those on a fairly regular basis. The more advanced calibrations required an oscilloscope and a vacuum tube voltmeter. Those were used for adjusting things like the head azimuth, which is the angle of the head to make sure that they're pointed in the right direction and some other stuff. Now back then, I couldn't afford an oscilloscope or a vacuum tube voltmeter, so I'd have a tech come out and do that stuff for me. The issue I'm having right now is that I've not done this in decades. I'm reading the manual, trying to re-familiarize myself with what I'm supposed to do. I think I'm doing it right. I put on the MRL tape, everything went pretty well. The issue I'm having is that when I put on a real of fresh tape and started checking the record level to the playback level on the sync head and the repro head, things were acting a little strange. I couldn't get consistent record levels on a couple of the tracks. I still don't own an oscilloscope or voltmeter. I'm not going to be able to get a tech out here for weeks, so it's not perfectly right, but I'm here and I just want to record something, so I'm going to give it a go anyway. I've been working on a project with my friend Slade. We've got a song called Live Fast, Die Slow that we recorded during a live stream. I'm going to take the drums, bass, and guitars from that song and run them through the tape machine. First, I routed the drums, bass, and two guitars out of Ableton through my Apogee converter into the patch bay and then into the tape machine. Then I set the levels for each track. As you can see, I like to hit the tape hard. Then I recorded everything to the tape machine. Then I switched the playback to the repro head and recorded it back into my computer. Now before I move on, I wanted to try something else. I wanted to experiment with tape speed. Now this machine runs at 30 inches per second or 30 IPS. Other machines ran at 15 IPS, which gave it a bit more of a thicker sound, a better low end. I can't switch this to 15 IPS, but I can do something else. This machine has a very speed mode. I'm gonna switch over to that and slow it down as much as I can. Tape speed profoundly affects the sound of your recordings. 
Now obviously slowing down some pre-recorded material is gonna make it pitched lower and sound thicker. But just recording at the lower speeds will change the sound. So next I recorded everything in at the slower tape speed. And then I recorded that back into my computer on different tracks. All right, so I got all three versions here, the original version, the 30 IPS version, and the slowed down version. Let's see what they sound like. This is the original. 30 IPS. Slowed down. Original, 30 IPS, slowed down, original, 30 IPS, slowed down, Obviously, you can hear a difference. You're going from the original to the 30 IPS version. You definitely hear it getting a little warmer, not as much high end, a little, you know, cushier sounding, I guess. Going to the slowed down version, it really got a lot darker, but it's almost like, seems like the pitch almost drops a little bit. Like it's, it's not just darker. It's almost like the tones are lower, which is what I was talking about, which is pretty cool. Now, certain types of processes are more apparent when you're doing it on a lot of tracks and playing them all at the same time. But let's see what it sounds like when we just solo up some of the drums and the bass and see what they sound like alone. Original. 30 IPS. Slow down. Original. 30 IPS. Slow down. That's interesting that it's not as noticeable of a difference when I'm just hearing the bass by itself, but I, I do like the slowed down one better. I think it's just capturing more of the low end. Here's the kick drum. This is the original. 30 IPS. Slowed down. The original. 30 IPS. Yeah, same kind of results. What's interesting on this particular one, you can definitely hear crosstalk when I switch to the 30 IPS version. You can hear a little bit of the bass on the left side, and that's something you'd get on tape machines where sometimes you'd pick up some sound from the adjacent track. It's probably worse right now because I know I, I need to get the heads adjusted and a couple other things. Let's try, uh, let's try snare drum. Here's the original. 30 IPS. Slow down. Original. 30 IPS. Slow down. That's one where not only do you hear the tonal difference, it literally sounds like the pitch is dropping as you go from tape and then to the slowed down version. It's, it literally is like the pitch is slightly lower, which is, is pretty interesting. And just for fun. And what you're hearing is all three versions, the original tracks from the computer, the ones that we recorded to 30 IPS tape, and the slowed down tape. And because tape is not accurate, it's kind of 
drifting around the computer, the they're going in and out of alignment slightly, and it just creates a cool flanging sound. I think that's really cool. You know, since I started digging back into pulling out all my old analog gear and getting it working and using it again, it reminds me, of course, why I like analog, but it also reminds me why I ran away from it as fast as I could into digital recording. Analog is unpredictable. It needs a lot of maintenance and attention. It takes a lot of time. It's not going to sound the same way the next day. And sometimes it'll let you down, but it'll also surprise you. Kind of like life. Millions of unpredictable, unique events. Like wind blowing through the leaves, ripples on a pond, building something out of wood, or hiking through the Quarang on the Isle of Skye in the middle of summer at 10 o'clock at night when the sun hardly sets, and seeing that, and falling in love. And while digital can make you more productive, it is ubiquitous. Everybody has the same software, and there are no surprises, except when your computer crashes because the software you're using was released before it was really ready. And that's why I use as much outboard gear as possible and play actual instruments in my productions, because my quest has always been to be unique and pour that into my work. Now, while I was one of the early adopters to record and mix songs completely in a computer, I do fear that technology is draining away our humanity, we're handing our imagination over to AI, and frankly, we're becoming lazy. Now, I can't give up my computer. I, I need it for work. But I am trying to find my way through this insane world without, without losing myself. And I'm also trying to figure out how to get gear that's like 40 years old to work properly and integrate it into my art. So I hope you'll come along for the ride. I have no idea what's going to happen.